morning, good morning. was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive Failures I try to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness and to your glorious name. You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day Now your mercy has saved my soul Freedom is all that I know. The old may move, Jesus, when I met you, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious day. I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day I needed rescue My sin was heavy But change break Got the weight of your glory I needed shelter was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken You were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future My eyes are open Cause when you call my name oh, I ran out of that grave Out of the dark to your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness And to your glorious day You call my name Time. You call my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day. Amen, amen.
No place I would rather be No place I would rather be No place I would rather be Is here in your love Here in your love No place I would rather be No place I would rather be No place I would rather be Than here in your love Here in your love And set a fire down in my soul I can't contain, I can't control I want more of you, God oh, I want more of you, God And set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, I can't control oh, I want more of you, God No place I would rather be There's no place I would rather be No, no place I would rather be Than here in your love, here in your love No place I would rather be There's no place I would rather be No place I would rather be Than here in your love Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, I can't control I want more of you, God Oh, I want more of you, God Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, I can't control I want more of you, God Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God Oh, I want more of you, God And set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, I can't control Oh, I want more of you, God No place, no place I would rather be, there's no place I would rather be, no, no place I would rather be, than here in your love, here in your love, no place I would rather be, there's no place I would rather be, no place I would rather be, than here in your love. Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, I can't control I want more of you, God Oh, I want more of you, God And set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, I can't control Oh, I want more of you, God To sit a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. Oh, I want more of you, God. Yes, I want more of you, God. And sit a fire down in my soul I can't contain, I can't control. Oh, I want more of you, God. Yes, Lord, we want more of you this morning. Oh God, we want to take this time for your presence to enter in this place, to circulate among us, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. One more time. And set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, 
I can't control Oh, I want more of you, God Oh, I want more of you, God And sit a fire down in my soul That I can't contain I can't control Oh, I want more of you, God We want more 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 Yeah, yeah So pour it out We want more 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 I would rather be and no place I would rather be and no place I would rather be than here in your love here in your love no place I would rather be and no place I would rather be no no place I would rather be than here in your love last time set a fire and sit a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. Oh, I want more of you, God. Oh, I want more of you, God. And sit a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God.
Thank you, Lord, Father, for this service you've given us today. We thank you, Lord. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Everyone can be seated. Here's the announcements. Good morning and welcome to Maranatha Christian Center. We are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. Is this your first time here? Thank you so much for joining us. And if you're watching online, thank you for being a part of our service as well. Before we continue with the rest of our service, we want to let you know what's going on right here at MCC. Hey parents, this announcement is just for you. Summer is almost here and there are some important things that you need to know. We will take a break from MCC Kids Worship for the months of June and July to allow our team to refresh and revive. Kids will stay with their parents in the main service for worship. And July is take four as we give all of our teachers a summer break on Wednesday nights. So there will be no Wednesday night services in July. August will be our big promo month as we will advance our students to the next grade level and kick off the fall semester with a back to school bash. So your kids will remain in the current classes that they are in for the summer and then will advance in August with the new school year. There will be lots of reminders throughout the summer for all that's coming up. And as always, if you have questions, please contact Leah Calhoun at kids at marinothedecab.org. This year, we will not be hosting VBS, but July 23rd through 26th is Kids Camp, and we are taking the largest group yet. So please be in prayer for all of our children and leaders. Our Mother's Day Out program, Little Sparks, is excited to be wrapping up another fun-filled year of learning. Now don't forget to register your little ones ages 15 months through five years before June 15th to receive a discount for the upcoming year. A new class will kick off August 8th. Well, that's it for today's announcements. If you'd like to know more about anything you've heard today, you can visit our website or email info at maranathadecab.org. You can also follow us on social media or opt in to get text updates on your mobile device. If you'd like to give your tithes and offerings, we have giving boxes at the front and back of the room, or you can give online by going to our website, maranathadecab.org. Okay, take a minute to say hi to someone next to you, and if you have kids ages birth through eighth grade, you can check them into their kids' classes now. Just head through the double doors to your left, and we'll be back in just a few minutes with an exciting message.
Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. What a blessing it is to be here, and I mean that literally. <laughs> I'm glad I get to be here this morning. Uh, many of you know, and some of you may not know, but uh, last Monday morning at 6 o'clock, I was at the hospital there in Mount Pleasant having total knee replacement done, and uh, so I'm a week on this side of it now. That's good. Uh, you know, someone said, well, when did you decide to do that? I said, well, I got to looking at how it was going, and I thought, you know, by the end of summer, it's still going to be end of summer. I can either have a new knee or that old knee. And so anyway, I chose to go with the new knee, and uh, so it's going good. And thank you guys for prayers, for coming by. Some of you come by, texted, and all the things that you've done. We appreciate that very much. But uh, things are going good. Uh, I don't know. I haven't got my report to whether I'm a good patient, a good patient or a bad patient yet. That was not me. That was something else. Uh, so anyway, I'm waiting to get my report card, see how I've done this week. But I think I've done pretty good. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this morning we just want to take a special moment and say uh, how grateful we are as a country, as a church, as a nation, to those who help fight to make our nation free. You know, freedom, <laughs> freedom is not free. And many paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. We're thankful for that. So as we celebrate this uh, Memorial Day weekend, we want to remember our, our nation, our nation's leaders, and just want to say that uh, we're thankful that, that God has uh, given us the freedom that we have. We need to use that freedom to take advantage of the time that we have to further his kingdom, to establish his kingdom. So we're excited about being able to do that. So I'm going to pray over our nation, and then I'm going to introduce our speaker for this morning. Father, we just want to thank you so much for this day. And God, we thank you for the nation that we have, that we're able to be free. We pray, God, that you would pour your spirit out upon our land from east, west, north, and south, and that the, the sojourners and that the lost and that the, the pilgrims would come back to you, Lord Jesus, for the prodigals to return. We just pray, God, for the nation that's been a prodigal nation to come back to you, God. With all the things that are going on, we recognize that these are end days, and we know there are certain signs and wonders that are going to happen in these end days, and we're looking for those things, but Lord, let us occupy until you come. Let us be caught being faithful and obedient to what you've called us to do in every area of life. We're all responsible for certain areas. And Father, we just thank you so much again for those who, who paid for our freedom, or even paying for our freedom right now, those who are serving and and guarding our freedom. We just give you glory and praise for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, you might notice behind me here, this is, if you haven't ever met Terry, this is Terry Tolliver, his wife, Judy, right here. And uh, they became part of our congregation a few years ago. Just very special people. And he has spoken on a Wednesday night. And uh, I didn't know if he was going to be able to fill in this time. But I'm so glad that he was able to because I get to hear him. Normally when we have someone fill in the pulpit that I don't get to be here, but uh, he's going to be filling in today and going to be sharing a message with you that I know you're going to enjoy. So let's make Terry Tolliver welcome this morning. Thank you, Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, do, don't take lightly being in this pulpit. Uh, this is, I think from this pulpit comes some great teaching from our pastor, and you get a chance to stand up here, and I'm very grateful for that, very honored for that. I want to share with you this morning some things about occupying. We'll talk about that in a moment, as Pastor said. If you're watching us online, welcome. If you're just tuning in, no, I'm not Pastor. He's a guy with very distinguished gray hair, uh, and I don't have much gray hair. I, mine didn't get gray. It just went away. So, uh, But I'm thankful to be here. Uh, I want to share with you real quick, because I just, so you know, some of you know I recently had a stroke, and so I... I'm, God's healed me. I'm thankful. But once in a while, my speech gets a little bit slurred, or I may stumble a little bit, but I haven't been drinking. It's all part of that. I had a good friend, Jack Wright, and I, I think I've told some of you before, but he was a fighter pilot. He wrote a book called Crash and Burn, and he survived a very traumatic crash, playing upside down, 100 yards down the, the runway, and messed him up pretty bad. He was in hospital for a year. They say he'd never live again, never walk again if he did survive. But anyway, Jack, very powerful man of God. And uh, Jack used to always say, we'd be in a restaurant, and he'd say, now, my speech is a little bit slurred, and I sometimes stagger uh, because of the injury. So I guarantee you, see those two cops over there? When I walk out of here, they're going to follow me to my car and say, uh, sir, you're not getting in that vehicle. And Jack always had these little cards with him and would say, well, let me tell you my story about how Christ saved me delivered me from almost dying. 
And so if I stumble a little bit or I walk a little bit, God's healing me. I'm going to be okay. All right? So, okay, the message this morning, I think, is to the body of Christ. It's to our church. And I believe with all my heart, you know, we're in the end times, last days. But sometimes I think we get so caught up in focusing on that that we lose sight of what we're really supposed to be doing. And so I want to share with you this morning what Jesus said when he shared uh, uh, one of the parables. He, he talked about the 10 talents, 10 mice, the 10 servants, basically told them, occupy until I come. Concern, concern yourself with that, with what I've given you, use effectively for me. And I think sometimes I'm guilty of that. I don't think I focus enough on that. The Christ said, occupy. And the word occupy, when we go back and look at the Greek and the Hebrew, that word basically used here meant stay busy, be busy, be industrious. And I think as a body of Christ, I'm talking to us this morning, as we need to focus on that. We need to ask ourselves, am I really busy for the things of Christ? And how, how do we do that? And I, I know I'm like you, we're all human. And I, sometimes I just get busy with life and I forget. But when I study Matthew chapter 5, and it's always been something that's touched me, and I've always said, God, what are you really telling me there? We call it the Beatitudes. And if you will, you have your Bible, you can turn with me to chapter 5. But in this, I believe with all my heart, that Christ gives us, this is one of his first major sermons. Uh, we see in the Gospels, it's the longest sermon in the Gospel that he taught. And he tells us some important things. And I thought, okay, how do I, how do I stay busy for you? And I think here is the foundation that Christ gives us is for you and I, for us as believers to say, this is, this is the foundation. You focus on these things. And he says, blessed are you. And we know when we think about the word blessed, what that means is him showing his favor upon us. And I don't know about you, but I want God's favor on my life. And so if I want that, I have to search out and say, what is it that you want from me? And here in the Beatitudes, he tells us some things that I think are very important and it may be a little bit different than you ever looked at it. You may have thought of these things. You may know these things. But I think when we dig deep into this, we can see that God is telling us, here's the foundation. Here's the foundation for all my moral teachings. Here's the, the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. And I'm bringing my spirit into this to help you understand what is the mission. So I think as we go through the Beatitudes in the Bible, chapter, Matthew chapter 5, and we look at that, we can say, is this a mission for me? Is this something that I should be focused on? So let's look at that this morning. I want to share with you, I think, again, as I shared with you, I think powerful teaching comes from this pulpit. Uh, I'm very thankful not all pulpits have that teaching. Not all churches have a Wednesday night meeting that we can gather and learn from. And I, I'm so blessed. I think last week we heard John teach and a pastor teaches on Wednesday night. And I'm so thankful that we can come and be equipped to do God's work. So let's take a look at some things this morning. I believe another thing pastor told us last week when he said, you know, we need to, if I'm paraphrasing some of it, we need to be studying the word of God and we need to be asking ourselves and telling ourselves, I don't know everything. I need to learn more. And I know as I study the Word, and I've been doing this for a while as a Christian, but as I study the Word, I'm constantly, as Pastor was talking about, maybe seeing something I never saw before that says, wow, this jumps out at me, and it equips me, and it helps me. So we need to be looking forward to that. And make an observation for ourselves, and I'm, I'm not I'm talking about myself, too. I think as I read the Bible sometimes, I read the Bible. But Jesus said, study my word, become knowledgeable of me, so that you need not to be a workman who need to be reproved. So he's telling me, don't just read it, but study it, understand it, okay? We need to do that, we need to do that in our life and take the time to study it. I'm a firm believer, you know, if you, you, the word hermeneutics means, you know, interpretation of philosophy or Bible. But we need to understand the Bible, and I've learned one thing I've learned. The Bible pretty much interprets itself. And if we study it, we find it, and we see, oh, that's what he meant. I can go back and look at that and say, oh, that's what Jesus was saying when he was quoting something from the Old Testament. Oh, that's what he was saying. So as I looked at the Beatitudes, I began to ask myself some questions and think I might learn from that. So this morning, again, turn with you in your Bible, and we're going to look at the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, this Sermon on the Mount, verses 5 through uh, later in the, in the uh, scripture there. And he says this. Okay, many things. The Beatitudes, they, they kind of, as I said, I think they're instruction to us, 
to go deep into our life and ask ourselves some questions and to follow what Jesus is really saying. It kind of shows me where my heart is when I begin to look at it. And again, we look at the depth of it and we look at the word and find out what's he talking about. We should occupy this world until he comes. He says, you're in this world, but you're not of this world, but he says, occupy. And we said a few moments ago, that means stay busy. Stay busy with what? Stay busy with the concerns of God. And if we do that, he said, I'm gonna bless you. He goes through these beatitudes and he constantly says, bless or blessed. That's his favor. He said, I wanna show my favor on you. It's a chapter for us there to look at love, what is true love. It's him showing, hey, I love you and I'm gonna bless you and I'm gonna give you my favor but there's something that we give in return, and that's the love we give in return. How do we do that? What do we do that expresses God's love to him and to others? We express our love to him by doing his will, right? We express our love to him by the worship we have. Incidentally, uh, did you enjoy worship this morning? You could feel the presence of God in that. You could feel the power of the Lord in that. He's there, he's there for us. We were taught, these people were taught by Jesus that this is a foundation again of life, and these, scriptures that we're going to look at this morning. So let's take a look at it. Hopefully it'll encourage you. Uh, I'm not a guy who wants to say, hey, something's wrong with you because I'm looking at myself, you know, as they say, but I talk to you. If I point a finger there, I've got three fingers pointing back at me saying, Terry, what about your life? Have you grasped these things? And I don't know about you, but I'm constantly, and I'm not, not pious, but I'm constantly saying, God, I'm not there. I need you. I need to know what you mean. I need to know what you want. I need to let it sink into my heart. I don't like ignore that. Let's look at these as we consider these. First, he begins, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, he, you know, there's people that interpret that and say, Oh, well, that's for the people that are downtrodden or, you know, just don't feel good about themselves and those kind of things. They just don't have the right attitude. He's talking about something deeper than that. He's talking about serving him, watching him. Clearly, Jesus said, he said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. Okay, he said that. So what does that tell me? That tells me that's not my just feeling that I'm down. It's talking about if I'm poor in spirit, what do I need? I need his spirit. And if I don't have his spirit, something's wrong. And when I'm poor in spirit and I realize that and realize that's the beginning of everything, and I, I know, you, I mean, I'm a sinner cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and set free. That's who I am. And if we realize that as we go through this life, that the beginning of it all begins with that spiritual attitude that we have. And to say, I am poor in spirit. Without your spirit, Lord, I have nothing. With his spirit, we have a lot. But we have to seek that. We have to find that. So he tells us that. We know that our spirit must seek his spirit. Therefore, I believe that what he's saying to us there is believe in me. Believe in me. Recognize my spirit and let that be a part of your life. I share, you know, I came, I, I was not a good guy. You know, I just was not a good person. And I was a little rock and roller and a boozer and a pill taker and a lot of bad stuff. But when I found Christ, people, and, and, and this is honor to God, not to self, when I found Christ, people that meet me said, you could not have been that person. I said, oh yeah, I was that person. People that knew me then and knew me later said, you're not the same person. Something happened. That's because I realized my spirit was nothing. I had nothing. I was forgiveness for the sin that was in my life. I was destitute for something. And that spirit of Christ that comes in changes our life. I went to a, I just share a story. Uh, when I gained my sobriety and all that kind of stuff and had given my heart to the Lord and changed my path in life, um, God did some cool stuff. And he led me into the ministry later. I became a pastor, uh, went to Bible college, all that kind of stuff. And when I went to a reunion, I wouldn't associate with any of my former people for like 25 years because I knew I didn't want to be in that world anymore. I wanted to be in God's kingdom. And when I went to this reunion, 25 year reunion, it's a true story, People actually lined up and said, I have to see this. I have to see this. I heard you're a preacher. I have to see this. One of the coaches that was in high school, um, I, I got kicked out of high school because of Rowdy and all that. But he, he, he heard my voice and he turned, he said, and I'm using his word. He said, oh my God, are you still alive? I thought you'd be dead six months after we kicked you out of high school. What happened? And I was able to share 
Jesus changed my life. That's a spirit that God wants us to realize. In ourselves, we have nothing. But in his spirit, in his power, we have it. And we find peace and we find joy. We're going to look at that this morning. In the next verse, he taught, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Could this blessing be... I don't think it's for everyone. You know, we hear that all the time, and I hear it used sometimes often at funerals, uh, and it, it has its place. But I don't think God was talking about mourning for the lost because mourning is not going to get us into heaven. It's okay to mourn. We need to mourn. But that in itself is not going to get us to heaven. What if we just talking about the mourning for the sin in the world and mourning for our own sin and that attitude of, of saying, Lord, I, I'm just lost this sin. I mourn for it. He talks about it in great detail. And he says he's going to bless it. He says, Romans 6, 23 said the wages of sin are death, right? The wages of sin are death, and the only way we can find that is through Christ. The entirety of the verse reads, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Is he telling us there that we need to be mournful for the sin in our life, that we need to be understanding the sin in the world, we need to be praying for this world, we need to be praying for others, we need to be hoping and praying for them. This verse could be interpreted to mean both spiritual and physical death, however it speaks of death and life. It says that the wages of sin are death, and that speaks of eternal life. Eternal life means that a person that you and I are included in that have everlasting life with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you think he's talking about that? Do you think he's saying, blessed are you, my favor is upon you, when you realize that the sin of this world is, is, is death, and we mourn over the loss of that. We're concerned over it. I believe that's what he's talking about. And I believe it takes a little bit of time when we begin to study and think. It takes a little bit of time to get to that point that we're willing to, to intercede for a lost and dying world. Wednesday night Bible study, uh, John taught it, and he was talking about letting that spirit in us change our attitude and be merciful and loving and kind. That comes from having Christ in our life. And again, when we realize that those who don't have Christ in this world, I don't know about you, know, but I mean, this world's pretty bad. Pretty bad. And I remember the things that we see now we thought we would never see, especially in this country. We'd never see it. The world is lost. It's dying. It's decaying. And Jesus is saying, mourn for that. Are you mournful over that sin? Are you mournful for your fellow man? Do you want to lead them to Christ? Do you want to share the gospel? Do you want to bring them to a place in Jesus? What did Jesus say in Matthew 25, 46? And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. You know, think about that for a moment. We have friends, we have relatives, and say, ah, we think, yeah, it'd be nice if they knew the Lord. It's deeper than that. Are you mournful for that? Does it grieve your soul to the point that you're on your hands and knees, that you're crying out to God and say, God, I want them delivered. I want to be an instrument. I want you to use me. I want the power of God to be in their life and mourn for that death. That's a powerful place to be. I shared one Wednesday night when we were teaching, there used to be a guy, I don't know if you heard him, but they called him uh, the Praying Hyde, and he was a preacher, and they say the power of God was so powerful in this man that he could walk, and this is back in a long time ago, but he could walk into a building and people would literally fall on their face before the Lord. When he died, they found that in his prayer room, his closet, the floor, wooden floor, was actually where he prayed on his knees. There were actually indentations in the floor. And they say well, his prayer was for the loss of the world. He prayed, he interceded, and cried out constantly. And he talked about how long he prayed. Now, I'm, I'm not in the how long you pray and all that, but the attitude of that. And he said that he would get up and pray like two hours every morning before he left his home. And he would pray for the intercession of a lost and dying world. The world being in been decaying for a long time. It's just now the rot's getting worse than it was before as we move in that vein. So are we there? How about John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That should be in our heart. We realize who he was. He is continuing his thought here. First, he said, blessed are those who recognize their sinful separation from God. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Now he has blessed are those who mourn for their sin, for they will be comforted. He will comfort you. He will bless you. He, verse 5, he taught, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
the meek is, it's not often used today in our lexicon. We don't say it a lot, but when you hear it, you think, ah, oh, those guys are wuss. You know, he's, he's, you know, he's too meek. What is, what is Christ saying to us there? He's saying to us, do you understand what your relationship is with me? Blessed are the meek who are willing to say, it's not a weakness. It's not someone who just does whatever, you know, somebody else says, but it's saying, I'm going to, I'm going to give up my strength for your strength. And looking to him for that strength to come into our life and give us power and authority and boldness. And take this, that message, if you will, to the land. Take the message to the lost every day, every day, living that, speaking it, so people know the power of the living Christ. That's what he wants from us. He says, be meek before me. Understand that you can't do all this in yourself. Come to me, subjugate that to me. Let me be your, your power. Let me come in and fill you with authority and boldness. He said to the disciples, he says, I give you authority to do all these things that I've done. You're going to do more than I did. Why, why did he say that? Because he was saying, be meek, understand who I am. I will give you that authority. I will take your life and use it in a way that maybe you didn't even understand it, couldn't grasp it. So blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. We need to understand that. Uh, I don't think, again, he's necessarily talking about just a person that's quiet and, you know, acquiesces to everything someone else wants. But he's saying, understand me. Come to me. Understand meekness. Understand that if you let me be your guide and me send the Holy Spirit to comfort you and strengthen you, you will accomplish what I want to. I like to think of this as the Beatitudes as a mission statement for my life. He's saying, look at these things. Employ them in your life. It's not shallow here. He's teaching. He's teaching in power and authority. And again, as I said, these are one of the foundations when his ministry, he just called some of the apostles. And he's teaching this. It's a foundation. He's beginning to build on his kingdom. He's beginning to say, these are the things I want you to build on and use in your life. Okay? We want to demonstrate that in power and authority. Verse 6, he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness righteousness sake and i i think again you know we're singing this morning and talking about the power of god coming into us and all those and i think do we do that do we really hunger and thirst after righteousness do we seek god on a daily basis and i'm not being critical i'm just saying i know myself sometimes you know and i know as a pastor you, we can get busy with doing god's work right <laughs> we're busy but are we really seeking God? Are we really understanding God? I'm thankful we have pastors that understand that and seek the Lord and they'll fall on him and use them in a mighty way and putting God always first. But going after that, being hungry after that. He's teaching here, and he's, it's the biblical, biblical scholars think that he maybe was referring to Psalms 41, verse 22, where David painted that picture of a deer panting for the water. And when you think of that, it's a pretty good picture. He's he got an animal crawling through the desert, thirsty, understanding that I, I have to get water. I'm thirsting for that water. And Jesus is kind of painting that kind of picture that David did and said, is that where your heart is? You're like an animal. You need to be like that. You need to be constantly realizing without the water of the living water of life that flows through Jesus Christ, I can't do this. I need that. I have to have it for my life. It will sustain me. It will strengthen me. I will grow. And we need to be, have that attitude. And we think of that deer, okay, doing whatever he can to get to that water because he knows he has to have it. How many times should we ask ourselves, I need the living water of Christ. I need that in my life. I need to be struggling for that. I need to be driving myself for that. I need to be realizing there's a lot of obstacles, a lot of things I got to get through and get over. There's mountains. There's shrubbery there's all kinds of stuff that i have to get through i have to get to that point it takes effort and energy on our part blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness jesus said i will give you water i will give you lean water the man who seeks me will never thirst again he will never hunger again because yeah, are we diligent in asking ourselves again we go back to reading and studying of his word you know he gives us this word everything's included in there it's like the um, manual for life, the operation manual. That's what it is. And he says, seek me first. Seek me first. All these things will be added unto you. So are we diligently seeking to find God's direction in our life? Are we really hungry for that? 
I don't know about you, when I get hungry, I'm going to go get something to eat and find something to eat. I recently had some health issues, so I can only eat certain things. And boy, I'll tell you, I'm hungry, and I'm in that cupboard, and I'm scrambling for what I can find. But I can only eat certain things. So I got to work to find that. But in, in the Word, do we diligently, earnestly seek righteousness? Do we seek that? We need to ask ourselves that. We need to be strong. Mr. I believe in all my heart we are, as I said a moment ago, I think we're in that time. Jesus could come anytime, snatch us out of this world. We know that. The word said, no man, no man knows the day and hour, but you know the season. We're pretty much in a season that that could happen in, but I have to ask myself, am I really ready for that? Have I done all that I could do? Have I, have I drawn in close enough to God that he uses me in a way that's effective for him, not for me, but effective for him. Uh, Judy and I, we can honestly say, I, the more we, and, and this is not boastful, we, we've been blessed, we've been blessed. But I think it's because we talk about the, the more we seek God, the more he blesses us. The more he says, he fulfills his words, that's what I'm gonna do, and he does it. So we have to move in, we have to force ourselves and try to get in there. That water that it should mean to us, that we've got to have it. We've got to get there. We've got to grow. Uh, righteous, in 520, it reads to us, we look at that real quick. In 520, it says, For I tell you that unless the righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. That's in the same message he's talking about. And he's talking about the Pharisees, they were great leaders in the church, right? They did all those things that are right. They came to church, they raised their hands, they worshiped, they do all those things, right? But he said, if your righteousness does not exceed that, what is he saying to us? He's saying, I'm looking at your heart. I'm looking at inside. I want you to press in and be close to me in a way that God can use you in a mighty, powerful, anointed way. That's the responsibility we have. And in these, again, in these attitudes, they're not just nice platitudes and things. That, oh, well, that'd be cool. You know, do this, do that. He's saying, this is what I want from you. Seek me. Move in. Get close to me. And as his ministry evolves over time, we see that much of what he taught, much of what he said can be brought right back to this and say, that's what he was talking about. That's what he was talking about. We need to move forward. In verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they receive mercy. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm not very merciful. <laughs> you know, I'm not. But he says to us, find my mercy. He's not talking about, oh, just be merciful and give things. And he's saying, being merciful. So what is the greatest gift that we have? Jesus Christ. Yeah. Eternal life. Promise of that. Be merciful. Share that. Show others. Let our life so show his mercy and his love that people see that. I, I share, I, again, I share a story on Wednesday night, but um, sometime back. But when I, I was working in drug and al alcohol abuse counseling, and it's a very frustrating work, <laughs> very frustrating. And I get to the point sometimes I go, God, what is the purpose in doing this? I'm not touching anybody's life. One of the pastors at one of our church I was on, um, he's funny, my office was down the hall, next to his and so one day i walked in there's a big sign on the wall with an arrow point says counseling that way i don't counsel anymore <laughs> he said i don't do it they don't listen but what it's very frustrating but in this life i was working as a uh, running a program for the government and i was dealing with drug addiction alcoholism and recovery and all that kind of thing and we had some people that were just not nice people drug addicts and the idea was you help them to get to a point so they can be a good employee and a good person in life. And uh, worked with this one guy for a long, long time. He was a bad dude, I mean, bad dude. And uh, he was not only using, but he was selling and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, the government got a bureaucracy to go through a lot of stuff to get rid of somebody. So we began that process. And I remember, he, he, and some of you have heard the story, but he stood on the steps of my office. It was in the chapel. And he stood on the steps when I went to personnel. I'd gone up and said, yeah, fire the guy. There's no hope. We're not, you know, he's just playing a game. And so they said, okay, so they took the action and, you know, all that stuff you have to do. And they were terminating his employment. And he stood on those steps of the chapel and he said to me, he said, I'm going to have a contract put on your life. I'm going to kill you, you so-and-so. 
Okay, now he could do this. I'll tell you what, I was a little worried about that. And again, you've heard, some of you heard the story. But he, year, I think it was about a year later, I had left that position. I went into the ministry and I was on staff at a church. And I got a call from the front office and they said, uh, Pastor Tolliver, um, there's a gentleman here to see you and his name is so-and-so. My heart dropped. I <laughs> go, this guy, what's he going to do? You know, I, man, I mean, I was really worried about that. But anyway, I, okay, Lord, I'm going to deal with this. And, and please understand, I say it's not, it's not boastful. It's not meant to be that. To say, wow, look at the life. It's not that. But anyway, he, I went out front, and his wife was with me. He says, we want to talk to you, Terry. I said, okay, let's go back to my office. We came back to my office. They unloaded their pockets of all drug paraphernalia and threw it in my trash can. And he said, I want what you have in your life. And I'm so thankful for that. And what did that say? All that says is God says, be merciful. I showed him mercy for a long time. I loved him in the Lord for a long time. Didn't mean I don't, didn't have to do something. But he says, I saw something in your life that I want in my life. And my wife wants it. And they became members of a church and a, a neighborhood in town and grew in the Lord and have a good life. So we need to understand that. And we need to ask ourselves, what kind of mercy are we showing? What are we doing to show that? Um, I often think of uh, her story of um, Kenneth Copeland told once, and he told a story about mercy, and he got up in the morning, and he said, I'd been praying, and I was so full of God, and he says, boy, I was, whoo, I was on fire. He said, I got in my car, and I'm driving to work, and this lady cut me off. He says, I found myself, he said, woman, if this was a tank, I'd drive over your car right now. Get out of my way. And he said, all of a sudden, he felt, the Holy Spirit kind of tapped him on the shoulder and said, Ooh, you're really merciful, aren't you? you? You got a long way to go, brother. How true is that for us? But how do we get that? We have to seek that. Jesus is telling us to be merciful, but he's also telling us, seek me, draw close to me, understand me. We can't have that mercy if we're not letting him flow in our life like we should. In verse 8, he taught, Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. What, what does that mean? Often when this word heart is used in the Bible, it's talking about our attitude or emotions, uh, talking about where we are. In John 14, 1, we read, let not your heart be troubled. In Proverbs 23, 7, man, as a man thinks so in his heart, so is he. We understand Hebrews 4, 12 talks about the thought and intent of the heart. And we find the story in Daniel, and he said he purposed in his heart in 1, 8. He purposed in his heart. So the question to me is, Jesus is teaching us, and he's saying, blessed are you with pure in heart. What does that mean? How do we get there? What do we do? The first whole verse, uh, Psalms 24, 3, 5 reads, for who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessings from the Lord. Maybe that's what Jesus was talking about. How do we do that? We, we have nothing, and we get a pure heart by seeking God. It's through his blood that our heart is cleansed. It's through that that our attitude is changed. It's through that that our life becomes worthy of something. Does this mean that we should also be free for all, from all selfish purposes? How many times do we come before the Lord as people? And God, if, you know, Judy and I talk about this early on in our life, if you will do this, Lord, I'm going to do this. What does that say? That's a selfish motive. That's not pure before the Lord. Say, Lord, here I am, useless, wretched. Here I am. I'm before you. I don't have anything to offer you, but through your salvation, through your blood, and through your goodness, my heart can be cleansed. My attitude can be changed. I can grow more. We need to be free of that. He also gave his life for us, each of us the sinners that we are, and when we grasp that, it begins to change our heart, put us into a different mode of how we think. David, in, in Psalms 139, in verse 24, David, in his devout um, teachings and writings, he said, Lord, give me a pure heart. Give that to me, Lord. Satisfy that. I want to see that. I want to see my heart change. Search my heart. Show me what wicked ways are within me. I want to ask you to raise your hand. How many of us ask the Lord that every day? And I, and I say this not as pious. I don't mean that. 
But I'm a pretty wretched person. <laughs> and every morning I have to say, God, forgive me for those things I've done that offend you. Forgive me for my attitude. Forgive me when I didn't show your mercy. Forgive me when I got mad because I hit my hand with a hammer. Um, forgive me because that's not glorifying to you. I want to have a pure heart before you understanding who you are and that your love purifies my heart. Search my heart. Help me. I found one day, I mentioned, I, again, I think I told somebody this, but with this stroke thing I had recently, my right side was a little messed up, still a little messed up, and I have a hard time with this leg and a hard time with this foot. And I was just giving this foot the dickens one day. I'm just tired of this, God. I'm tired of this. You know, this foot is just driving me crazy. I can't get dressed. My foot gets stuck in my pants. I can't get high enough sometimes to even get into my clothes. I'm tired of this, God. And he said, <laughs> why don't you try asking me to bless it instead of curse it? You're my creation, and I know about you, and I care about you. And basically what he's saying, where's your heart, Terry? <laughs> where's your heart? Is your heart focused on me? Are you allowing me to reveal these things to you that maybe your attitude just stinks, right? <laughs> Maybe it just stinks. And you need to understand that I want to help you. So I need to understand that. I want that to have a pure heart. He said, blessed, my favor is upon you if you have a pure heart. So we need to work towards that, strive towards that. As we do that, not only do we become stronger, but our church becomes stronger and more powerful. I love the name of our church, Maranatha. It's God come. God has come, his power is here, anointing is here, he has come, and we need to be able to share that with the world. And if I don't have a pure heart and a clean heart and an understanding of God's power in my life, I don't get all the full blessings that he has. Right? Say amen. amen. Turn to the verse the next year and says, yeah, that's right. We need to seek that. We need to understand that. So he's telling us to do something here, to move in that vein. We need to grow here in verse 9, we read, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be known as the children of God. Now, this is a powerful statement. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be known as the children of God. When I was in the military, I was with the Air Force, and I was a the spook outfit. But we, the Air Force had got this big ICB missile, and they called it the peacemaker. And I remember even though I wasn't serving God, but I remember, oh, yeah, that really brings peace. That just blow the dickens out of everything. That, that's not the kind of peace he was talking about. But he's talking about who, who, is the, who is the great peacemaker? Jesus. He is the peacemaker. So Isaiah 9, we read in verse 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's a Prince of Peace. So who's he talking about here? Blessed are the peacemakers. How am I going to bring peace? I can bring peace by helping others find Jesus Christ in their life, and when they find them and seek him, they too have peace. Say amen. That's right. So we are peacemakers when we are bringing people to the fulfillment of understanding of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about in deep, deep sense here. He's addressing us spiritually. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Where do we find that peace? We find it in him, and as we share it, we help others find it, they grow. So peace comes through Christ. If we reconcile sinners with Jesus, where that's where they can find true everlasting peace. We are peacemakers. Are we busy? Are we occupying? Are we busy in our occupation of land helping others to find that? I've, I've been sort of saying in my time, and again, I'm not, I'm not being critical, but I've been in the, in the ministry for a while, recently retired, but you never retire from the ministry. But been in the ministry for a while, and I find that a lot of us are not occupying. A lot of us are not trying to help others find peace in Jesus Christ. We're not showing mercies. I worked in corrections uh, for a while. I was a, a head chaplain for 7,000 inmates. And I found, I thought I knew what mercy was until I got involved with some of these people. And I found myself asking myself a lot of questions. I mean, I, I did, you know, cut these guys off, whatever. Still somebody like, you know, they sue me all the time. I'm still getting sued from things that happened back then. But I, I had no mercy. And then I began to find out life stories. 
And I began to find out these people who never really heard about Christ, never heard the word of God. And the Lord laid on my heart, you have to have some mercy on these people because they've never heard my word. They've never had peace. Then I had one man tell me, he said, I've never, I've never known there was a Bible. I honestly didn't know that. I never knew who God was. I thought he was a curse word. That's it. And I began to think, wow, I need to understand that. I need to have the mercy, and I need to be able to help them come to that peace in Christ that can change their life. And through God, we see all that happen many, many times, many times. And I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity to do that. And so I get upset with it, but I understand that. In verse 11 through 12, we read, Blessed are those when people insult you and persecute you falsely, say all kinds of things of evil against you because of who? Because of me. Now, sometimes things we get carried away. And we think, well, he's talking about I get persecuted because this person said that or that. Why did he say he said because of me? Are we showing in our life the love, the power, the majesty, the greatness of God so much that people persecute us for that? That's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about your neighbor said you're stupid because your fence fell down. That's not persecution. We're talking about, he says, is your life of such that you're being cursed? He says, that's okay. Blessed are you when that happens because the prophets were persecuted. I used to, I used to ask myself, and I'm, I'm not asking for trouble. I'm not asking myself. And again, please, I'm not being pious. But I asked myself once, who am I not to be persecuted for Christ? Look at the apostles. Look at what happened to them. Look at people. I was just work, work, work with a group in India. And I, we were over there, and we bring raise money for this mission work. And we were in this meeting once, and we had speakers there, you know, sharing what we did. So these people that we brought over would, you know, try to raise money for it. And um, one that we're meeting up in, uh, I forget where it was. But anyway, we were meeting, and one gentleman was there who, he wasn't supposed to be there. He was an Indian pastor. We used to train pastors and equip them for ministry and it was called, quite a neat organization called Mission for India. And, and this little gentleman, the coordinator of the group, said, uh, why are you, I forget his name, but says, why are you here? You weren't supposed to be here. And he said, well, uh, I got burned out in my village. My church got burned down just the other day. We were attacked by the Muslims and the Marxists joined together and attacked our town. And they killed several people, and they burned all my property down, and they chased us out of the town. So I'm here. And one gentleman we brought over was, you know, businessman trying to get money. And he said, well, what are you going to do? And this little guy said, well, I'm going back tomorrow to my village. And he says, why are you going back to your village when they're trying to kill you? He said, because that's where God has called me. That's what he called me to do. And if I'm derelict in doing that, how's he going to bless me? How's he going to touch me if I'm afraid of persecution? And I think how blessed we are, how blessed we are. Um, again, I share a story, but I like to share stories, and probably shared this before. But when I was working in the institution, if we had a lot of Muslims in this come in incarcerated, and they come in with you know, all their demands and all their stuff. But this lady had come in, they filed a grievance against me because they had a process, they want special food, they want all this, and you know, I could delay certain things because you found that, you know, they're cons, so a lot of them are cons, they're just trying to get special stuff. So I, I would put them off for a while, It'd take about 15 days before I'd answer them. And so this one lady I didn't answer, and 15 days went by and I still didn't answer, and then I walked in the next morning and I had a grievance, um, which is usually the first step to a lawsuit. So I had a grievance, and you have to go through this big answer and fill out all this paperwork and why it was delayed and all that. So I said, well, I better go meet with her and talk to her, Muslim lady. And you have to understand that when you Muslim converts to Christ, you know this, but you are not accepted. Your family will get rid of you, basically. You're, you're done with it. They don't want anything to do with you. And I walked in. This lady came down, and she, was, she wanted her ajib. She wanted all kinds of stuff. And Anyway, she came down, and I said, first of all, being politically, I said, I, I want to apologize. She says, oh, chaplain, don't apologize. Don't apologize. 
during your delay. She says, do you believe that Christ could visit me? I said, oh, I believe he could. You know, I believe he could. She says, during this time, I was in my bed, and I asked Allah. And she said, I was crying out. Allah means God, right? And he said, I was crying out for truth. He said, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ stood at the end of my bed and said, I am truth. I want to set you free. And she said, I started weeping, and she couldn't talk to me without weeping. And she says, and I asked him to come to me and strengthen me and be a part of my life. She says, forgive me for offending you and putting a grievance in against you. And we sat and talked for a while, and I, that was wonderful. But knowing she came out of Islam, she says, my family is going to disown me. My friends are going to disown me. This is what's going to happen. But I know now the truth. I know who Jesus is. That's pretty powerful. But that's persecution. That's persecution. Now, I don't know about you. As Judy and I watch the news, I get kind of frustrated. And I have to seek God because I'm ready to throw a brick through the television. But I get very frustrated. And God has to remind me, where's your mercy? Where's your understanding? This world, put it in the, this world is literally going to hell. That's where they're headed. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell. That's what's happening in this world. So I look at my country and I go, Lord, I'm just frustrated with this. And he talks to me. Again, I may have shared this story, but there was one time, I think I shared it with pastors, I think, but there was one time when I was in my living room and I was there by myself and it's just several years ago. And I was watching television and I was frustrated. So I decided I was going to tell God what he needed to do. I tell you what, Lord, I am tired. This country is a mess. When are you going to intervene? What are you going to do? And I, I, I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever really heard God, but that's still a small voice. And he said this to me. He said, Terry, where's your faith? Is your faith in a flag? I'm a combat veteran. Yeah, I'm, I'm patriotic. But he says, is your faith in a flag? Is your faith in a country? Is your faith in a man? Or is your faith in me? All this will pass away, but I remain the same. And I remember how that touched me. And I literally fell on my face and said, God, forgive me. My motives have been wrong. Forgive me. I know you can heal my land. I know you can do that. But I have to understand that that sin in this world is what I'm fighting. And I'm fighting it through the power of your majesty and your grace and your authority. And I need to understand that. My job is not to change the country. I'm, I'm, Pat Robertson, when um, he ran for president, and I remember he first said God told him to run for president. He said he never told me I was going to be elected. But he, you all know who Pat Robertson is, Seven Hundred Club. I worked for him for a while. Very powerful man in the Lord. Very powerful man. A man of prayer. Great man. And he said one day on TV, he was interviewed on it, and they were saying, well, if you become president, are you going to move for this law and this law and this law? And he said, laws will not change man's heart, but the power of Jesus Christ will change their heart. My task is to do that. And he said later on, I don't know, maybe that was all God wanted me to do, to get on national TV and say that. But there's truth to that, and I have to remember that. I have to remember that. So I need to go on. Are you the light of the world? Jesus tells us. Let's go and look at some of the scriptures there. As I go down to verse 17, he's given us some beatitudes, and he said, we need to understand all this thing. We read, read in verse 13, he says, Jesus said, are, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its savor, basically loses its effectiveness, what good is it? You might as well be trampled on your feet. Wow. And ask ourselves, are we the salt of the earth? So he's saying, he's given some guidelines here, and then he asks us, you are the salt of the earth. You bring truth. You bring, you bring that, you know, salt used to be a, a preservative, basically, to cure stuff. Are you doing that in this world? Are you bringing truth to this world? Are you manifesting the truth in your life? Are you walking that? You're the salt of the earth. Remember that. And he goes on to say, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill has a light that everybody can see. You know, I like a lighthouse. When you go on lighthouse tours and you, you see that light was a beacon of hope, a beacon of direction, you are that. He said, does a man light a candle stand, light his candle and then hide it? 
No, he puts it up on a stand so you can see, so you can see light. So he says to us, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, and we ask ourselves, what are we doing with it? What are we doing with it? He's given us these directions here. He's saying manifest these things in your life, and I will bless you. I will show favor on you because you are living that in the world and trying to be effective for me. I can't be effective for him. Dare say, you can't be effective for him if we're not pushing in and seeking him, seeking him every day. I've tried in my life, and I've got a long ways to go, I'll tell you what, because I find myself every once in a while, I say, God, I'm so sorry. I just offended you, and I'm so sorry. Has that crept into our life with that attitude so that we know if someone does cut us off and we get angry? I'm trying in my life to show that when you know, I'm driving down. I'm trying. I'm not very good at it. You can ask Judy. Somebody gets in front of us or going too slow in front of us on the highway. Boy, I'm ready to get out and get up there and straighten them out. But I'm trying to say, Lord, teach me. What is the point of this? Maybe there's something I need to be praying about. I'm trying to reach that point in my life where I, where I let these blessings, these beatitudes be a part of my life every day to flow through me. Not there yet. We keep working at it. We want to put our lights in, our candle up where they can see it. So I close with this. Should we take the Beatitudes as a mission statement, as I said earlier, to be that part of our life and guide us and direct us? More than just reading a nice story about, oh, if you do this, that's good. No. Am I obligated to do this? If I do this in my life, does it change my life as well? It's changing other lives. Blessed are they. I show favor on you if you do these things. Move to that point. Understand what he's talking to us about. Pray for the lost. Intercede. Let them know that we care about them. Have we been occupying with a person? It was a purpose of business. Occupy means business, busyness, working, doing something. Has that, do we do that? Have we reached that? Understand. It's good to wonder, I think, uh, you know, when the end's coming. Jesus is coming. Our marquee says, Jesus is coming. He is coming. We know that. When? We're not sure. But as I said earlier, I believe it could be at any day, any time, place is a mess. And he says, when, often think, you know, Jesus said, so as they were in Noah's day, they shall be in the end of time. Sometimes do a history study on what they were like in Noah's day and what the scholars think and what the Jews think of the finding of all that stuff. Pretty interesting. Pretty interesting how it parallels in today's society. When these saints says, look up, look up, because your redemption is all nice. So I have to say, am I busy enough for you, Lord? Now, not busy for busy's sake, no. But am I busy enough with an attitude of seeking you, seeking your righteousness, seeking your love and your power for what purpose? Not so that I can be blessed. He says, I'll bless you if you do that, but that's not the purpose in doing it. The purpose is in helping this lost world helping those who just don't have anyone. So it's okay to wonder about when the end times is, but we should also be concerned with sharing, in essence, the Sermon on the Mount, what it means to us and what it means to others. What does he say about it? I want to help others understand that knowledge of Jesus Christ, that is coming back. First, we have to ask ourselves, do we realize that when we're poor in spirit, when we understand that it's not in us, it's not within our power to do anything. But when Jesus Christ comes into us through his power, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, you'll be blessed. But you gotta understand that. You have poor in spirit. Not to come in and say, well, I know people, I know one guy, um, as a matter of fact, we had a business together for years, but he was kind of an evangelist and he would go do these things and he was raising money to build this Bible school and um, we were raising it through a nonprofit to build this Bible school in the Philippines. Well, he was all upset when they didn't name the Bible school after him. The question is, where was his heart? Was he meek in spirit? No. Was he doing that for the glory of God? No. He's doing that for his self and for his gratification, for people to say, wow, look at him. Look at what he did. What do we do and how do we do it and why do we do it? Okay, number two, do we mourn over the sin and loss of the world. We talked about that, okay? Do we truly mourn about it? I don't think that's something we just wake up in the morning and say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm gonna pray for the world and pray for all the sin. But when we move in with an address, I, can, I, I use my life as an example because it's my life and I know it, right? I only know what's happened in my life. 
But I know that the more I begin to pray for that, you know, we watch the TV like I showed you, and, and I, I know but still we have a natural man creeps up every once in a while. And we'll be watching something, and, and we'll ask the question, why can't they see? And then God reminds me, and I think this comes as we move in, God reminds me, they're deceived. They're blinded. They're following the father of lies. They don't realize they're not hearing. And I realize, Father, my battle is not against them. I have to show mercy on them, right, John? <laughs> I have to show mercy on them and understand that they're deceived. And my prayer is be, God, help us. Help them to find truth. Send people into their life. Let the Holy Spirit come in a mighty, powerful way. That's what I need to be focused on. Because when I focus on them, I'll tell you what. Second Amendment, I could go to Washington, D.C. and do a job. You know, it's all right. I digress more. I have a friend who was in politics for a long time, congressman. He came out. He went back. He was very powerful. And, and he went back, but we were having a burger one day. He was home. And he said, Terry, I'm not going to do this anymore. I can't do this. He's, he's a good man, good Christian man. He said the evilness in Washington, the greed by congressman, I don't, he's a Republican, right? He said, the greed by people is so powerful that I, I can't do this anymore. I would rather be on the outside and praying and working. It can't be done inside. He said, Satan has really grabbed control of a lot of stuff. And that's a powerful statement. He's a good man, a good man. And he said, I can't do it anymore. I can't be concerned with just money. I want to be effective for the nation, and I'm not. And he was instrumental in starting a lot of Bible studies in Washington, a lot of stuff. But I say that to say, where's our heart as individuals? Where's our heart? Okay, three. Does our meanness allow us to have the strength of the Holy Spirit in us? Sure, we need to do that. And the closer we press in, the more we press in, our heart begins to change. You know, I, I don't know about you, but when I came to Christ, yeah, God's still revealing a lot of things to me. Say, Terry, throw them out. <laughs> you know, get rid of them. But the closer I get, more and more he reveals to me. And he says, now you understand meekness. Don't do this. No problem. Um, one more story. I know we're closing here in a moment. Uh, one more story, and again, her on Wednesday night, one time I shared this story. Uh, I was on staff at a church, and the pastor... Um, put me in charge of a lot of stuff, but then I found out there was a lot of wrong stuff going on. And I, he asked me to set up these operation orders, all that. And I said, Pastor, we're, we're violating IRS policy here. And I, I don't think we should be doing that. He said, you don't worry about that. That's my business. Well, a lot of things went on, and he, he, I, I realized just a lot of things were going on. And I began to intercede in prayer um, and do that. And one day, uh, I realized some tension building between he and I. And one day, we're in a meeting. It was a staff kind of meeting. And he said to me, something said, I want you to do this. And I said, uh, Pastor, I'm not about doing anything. But I'm not going to do that for your glory. We're not gonna, I'm not going to do that. And I said, I don't think it's the right thing to do. I don't mean to question you, but I, I just... I don't think we should do that. He said to me, well, you go and pack your stuff, then you're gone. Okay, and I understand that, but this was a, this was a serious thing. He says, pack your stuff and you're gone. And he got in the pulpit and told a magnitude of lies, all kinds of things. And I had people calling me on the phone say, did you do this? I said, uh, no. Did you say this? Uh, no. And he said, well, he's seen the pulpit. I was at the Assembly of God at the time. He said that he told me that they're going to pull your ordination from the Assemblies of God because of what you did. I said, well, no, I don't do that. And I don't know anything about them pulling my ordination because I haven't heard anything. So I'm going to handle this in the flesh, right? And I'm going to take this guy home. So I told him, I'll say, okay. I called the district big shots. I called them the Sanhedrin. And <laughs> anyway, I called them and I said, uh, this guy is standing in the pulpit and he's saying things about me that are causing me serious problems in the community, with other churches. And if he doesn't stop, I'm going to take it to the court and I'm going to sue him. And I will be him. 
So the dis- district superintendent, good man, good man, wise man. I don't like you, Pastor. Wise, good. And he called me. He said, can I come have coffee with you? I said, yeah, come on down. And he said, so what are you going to do, Terry? I said, I'm going to sue him. And if you don't do something, I'm going to sue you. And I'm going to sue the general counsel. I'm going to sue everybody. <laughs> really good, right? And he said to me, he said, you could do that, and you'd probably win in a court of law. You would probably win because what he's doing is wrong. But he said, let me tell you my story. He said, I was a youth pastor once. Similar thing happened. He said, I got fired. I got fired. And he said, I remember the pastor told me, he said, you will never amount to anything, young man. Um, superintendent of the large district of the Assemblies of God. I think God's kind of had his hand on me, don't you think? And I said, well, yeah. He says, here's my, here's my point, Terry. You can fight this in the natural, and you can win. Or you can let God handle it. If you, if you fight him, and that church winds up closing its doors because of what happened, how are you going to feel about that? Or you can sit back and let God do a thing, and God will do a thing, and you'll be honored. That was hard to do, you know, but something I had to learn. I said, okay, that's what I'll do. So I didn't fight him. The church board members started calling me. This is about a year later. And they started calling me and saying, I want to apologize to you for taking that side and realizing now what was going on. And I apologize. Please accept my apology. You, you don't have to apologize. I understand what happened, you know. The district came to the church, then asked the pastor to leave. He said, we, don't, we can't have you leading our congregation anymore. So he, he then started trying to find another. I'm, I'm sharing all this as a point. God doing his thing, his power, as we seek in a move and let him do his power, realizing our meekness. So he then started trying to find another church, and the district put out the word, don't hire him, right? So he said, I'll leave the district. And he left the district. He went somewhere back in North Carolina. Then about three years later, he called back and said, I really think I'm ready to come back. And the superintendent told him, you're not welcome in our district. Now, I say all that to say God is powerful. If we, if we understand that and we let him do his thing, he's going to do his thing. He's going to move it on my way. We need to understand let him be God. We need to be meek in that. Are you hungry? Are you thirsting for righteousness? We ask for that. We have to push in. And I find in Jude and I said, find the more we seek God, the more he blesses us. He can't lie. And he said in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who do this. I'm going to show you favor. He does. He shows favor to us. He blesses us. How do we show mercy? As I said, we have to show the mercies of God. We need to understand that. We need to know that he is God, he is powerful. Let his mercy shine through us. It glorifies him. Are we spreading his word? Are we so mournful of the loss that we're spreading the word? Do we do that whenever we can? Do we touch lives wherever we can? You know, I used to, I, I know people that are, I sometimes say, God, I want to be like that. But then I take a step back and say, I don't know, I don't know, that's kind of scary. But see, when God says no, they want to be like that. They're like that. And as crazy as it seems, I bless their life, and I touch them, and I flow through them, and I touch other people. That's where I need to be. That's where I need to, need to move into that. I need to try to do that, showing his power. How do we handle persecution? Do we understand persecution, really? Do we let it touch us and move us? Are we the salt of the earth? I leave you with that thought. Are we occupying in such a way that we are the salt of the earth? That we're God's preservative for this people to help them have eternal life. Are we mourning so much for the loss of the world that we say, use me, Lord. Am I a light? Am I a beacon? You know, I, I know, you know, I know sometimes when you're, you're in the presence of somebody and they walk in and you say, wow. Jude Knight says, do you feel it? You know they're a believer. You just feel that radiate from them because the power is upon them. And they know it. I want to be like that. I want to go everywhere I go, I feel that. We occupy with, occupy with a purpose. Jesus told us his disciples, go and make disciples of the people. That's what he's talking about, occupying. Again, Maranatha said, the Lord has come. The Lord will come. The Lord is here. Do we realize that? His spirit is here in us to reach the lost of the world. And we reach the lost of the world by employing what he taught 
in the Beatitudes, saying, take these and go for them. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. In his sermon here, he goes on in verse 7. Verse 24, let me read to that. In verse 24, when he says, uh, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, be forgiving and understand we need to do that. We need to have this inner life. If we have any shake your head like that, say, that's true. Yeah, we do. And we need to constantly ask ourselves. And I, I share with you, just like I said, I am not, you can come on up. I am not perfect <laughs> by no means, but I want to be perfect in Christ's eyes. And I want to do what he wants from me. And I can't do what he wants from me unless I know him. Unless I move in that vein with him and allow him to come in his fullness and his power and pour out his spirit. I, I, you know, when I look at church and I say, you know, we, we come to church and like I said, we are blessed. I mean, we have a great pastors. We have good pastors. And we have pastors that teach the word of God, not to bring anything to themselves. They come and they bring straight from the word. That's so important. When you get an email from one of them and they tell you they're praying, you know they're praying. That power is there. That anointing is there. What if every one of us, every one of us in the body, had that kind of ministry? Woo! We see the whole town converted to Christ. Could that happen? Yeah, that could happen. But it comes back to we have a responsibility to grow and to prosper in the Lord. I hope you've grabbed some of that this morning. I hope it helps you a little bit in your growth process. And again, if I stepped on your toes, uh, I stepped on my own toes. You know, I was with a pastor once and he said, now I'm going to preach and step on your toes. So if you don't want to step on, pull them back under your pew. So you only stepped on. With that, the pastor's going to come and he's going to close for you this morning. Thank you, God bless you, and let the Word of God permeate your life with strength and authority, knowing who we are. All right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that this morning. What a powerful word, and what a good admonition it is. You know, if our lives aren't what they ought to be, we need to change our attitude, don't we? Because we're going to be what we think and how we act. So that's a good, good word, the be attitudes. Have those attitudes and you'll be like we ought to be. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never received Christ as your Savior, and uh, you want to do that today. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a moment. And uh, possibly you've realized that uh, as you were there that some of your attitudes uh, are stinking. You know, they're just not the right attitude to have. And you want to get rid of that right now. We'd love to pray with you. We'll have the altar here open for just a few moments, and we'll be glad to pray with anyone who wants to come. So as you stand right now, if you need to receive Christ as your Savior, would you come on down real quickly? If you want someone to pray with you about something going on in your life, maybe you've been convicted about something that uh, you're feeling and you just need to, need to get that out in the open, and, and you need to pray over that. We'll be glad to do that with you also. Anyone? It's been such a privilege to be here this morning to worship with you, to enjoy the presence of God, the peace of God that passes all understanding. I want to say a special thanks to John for Wednesday night service. Heard a lot of good reports on that. Thank you for that. So good to have people in your congregation that you can just say, hey, uh, can you share for us this time, at this time? And they'll say, yeah, be glad to. I mean, I'd like to have people knocking on the door saying, hey, I got something I want to share. When can I share this? You know, So uh, we appreciate that. Thank you again, Terry and Judy. We appreciate you guys in the ministry. We're very blessed to have you as part of this work and blessed to be able to uh, occupy along the side of you. That's great. That's great. Anyone need to come for anything real quickly? If not, we're going to close. If you've been joining us online, we want to say thank you for joining us. We appreciate every week those who join us online. Father, we want to thank you for this day. The beautiful day that you've given us, we thank you for your love. Thank you, God, that that love is a special love, a love that, that comes toward us even when we don't, do, don't respond properly. Thank you that your love was demonstrated on the cross when Jesus Christ, who died, gave his life that we might have eternal life. Thank you for that. We don't take that for granted. Once again, thank you for our nation. We pray over our nation and over our nation's leaders again as we become one nation under one God and give you the glory and praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a guest here this morning, we'll be making our way over. And uh, if we...
be making our way over there, and uh, you can come by, and uh, we'd like to meet with you, okay? Thank you. You're dismissed.